Okay, a very good morning to all our dear viewers and listeners. Once again, you're welcome to our weekly talk show, Akvim Talks. We've been doing this for the last, it's coming to four months now, consistent. Every Friday, same time, we are here discussing nothing other than the topical issues that are mainly uh, happening in our country, but we limit ourselves to uh, things concerning money in politics. You can't talk about money in politics and you don't talk about the economy in itself. So today we are discussing and we are analyzing Uganda's economy, especially in the aftermath of the 2021 elections. Uh, with me in the studios, I have two uh, individuals that I'm going to be uh, um, introducing in a short while, but yours truly, I remain Felix Kafuma, your moderator again. Um, and as usual, I allow me to start that before I introduce my guests, I first want to encourage each one of you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, which is uh, ACFIM, so that you get the uh, live updates on and, and how, especially when we will be running this continuously. So please take some time, hit the tab, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, which is ACFIM. All right. Uh, in the studios, I have a lady and a gentleman. Both of them have a legal background, so um, I'm the only unlearned friend <laughs> that's it. But I'll catch up. Let me start with the lady. Um, since we are in a month where we are celebrating women, um, she's called Christine Biringiro. I hope I get your names right, especially. Uh, she's the program manager. Um, under the policy and analysis governance program, she's working with Uganda Debt Network, UDN, uh, one of those um, organizations that um, has a deep history in monitoring our debt, Uganda's debt. And I think part of this history is rooted in the way um, the Uganda's debt uh, at some point was running out of hand and they came up to advocate for a clean start. And I think we shall be having a discussion in that direction. So she has a bachelor's of law degree and she's uh, passionate about uplifting the plight of the poor and the marginalized um, to ensure that they realize their rights. She's passionate about uh, supporting the poor people in the development agenda. And she's been in this business for the last nine years. I think we have the right person to discuss issues concerning uh, issues concerning our, the economy of Uganda. Then, our other colleague who has joined us in the studio is a man, a gentleman, also with a legal background. He goes by the names Katavazi Patrick. Is it so? Am I right? Yes, it is. Yes. Uh -huh. He's an economist, but he's also a lawyer and with a wealth of 16 professional experience in the areas of uh, fiscal planning and, and analysis, public finance management, policy and legal reforms. He has done a lot of work around national budget analysis. I think I first met Kataba as when he was still working with the uh, civil society budget advocacy group. At some point, we did some work together. Again, we were trying to understand the budget of Uganda in, as we were running towards the 2016 elections. Um, so I'm very sure that um, we have the right person on the site. He has worked with the Parliamentary Budget Office for eight years. He's an alumnus for International Monetary Fund Institute for, for Financial Programming and Policies. Uh, he's also the leading expert and advocate for expanding fiscal space for social protection in Uganda. And yes, garnered a lot of experience trying to advise Parliament on social development sector. He has also undertaken a number of consultancies and coordinating a number of projects that involve government and development partners in the same direction. I think he's currently spearheading the creation of the he's spearheading the creation of the Uganda Parliamentary Forum on Social Protection, and uh, he has also coordinated the consultancy services on behalf of Cambridge Resources International as the national local representative for the development of national parameters in support for projects appraisal in public and private partnerships together with the Ministry of Finance. So we have wealth of experience to pick from 
in between Patrick and Christine. But let me first lay the foundation. If you've, uh, if you've been following some of the revelations coming out of the Otter General's report, there are a few things I need to first point out. One, um, I think the budget for 2020, 2021 that has been approved is it's about slightly over 45, 45 trillion. Um, um, in 2020, 2019 and 2020, uh, the budget projections then, uh, which was approved was about 40 trillion. Uh, although I think much less uh, was, was, was allocated and financed. But the things that are of importance and concern to us are the things that I want to look at. In terms of one, the supplemental funding, because there are a number of questions around there. I was According to the Auditor General's report, no, our supplementary budget. So they end up. Um, I seem to be having a network problem. I think I'm back online. Um, our borrowing, our borrowing as 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 government, as as Uganda, has been growing exponentially at alarming levels. Um, as I speak now, I think where we are at the moment, um, as of. October 2020, our debt stock is standing at 63.35 trillion Uganda shillings. Um, in, June, in, in June 2020, our loan portfolio was standing at 46 trillion. Um, but if I can take you back, I think in, in 2016, our loan portfolio was standing at 28 trillion. So over the years, it has been growing. From 28 trillion in 2016 to now uh, 63 trillion Uganda shillings, it means that we are not just about to stop borrowing. We just have an insatiable appetite for borrowing. So we have a discussion and conversation around that. And what does that mean to the ordinary Ugandan? Um, another thing that I think is important for us to talk about and discuss that is of importance as we move along are the issues to do with. Uh, how um how our loans when we are negotiating our loans how how secure is uganda not find itself in a situation whereby our assets are mortgaged um because magufuli john pombe magufuli john pombe magufuli i think has given us something to talk about and to reconsider I may point out that majority of the things we are talking about Tanzania and the developments from the standard gauge railway to revival of Air Tanzania to to um, to the new terminal projects he has undertaken to also to a point of where he has also been able to renegotiate to re, uh, to, to renegotiate. Uh, where he was able to renegotiate the loan agreements with the Chinese and other Western leaders to a point of also um, ensuring that uh, he increases, he expands education, constructs, constructing sand gauge railway, all those things he did, majority of it was done by local financing. We don't necessarily borrow. But the arguments have been in the direction when, where Uganda is qualifying its appetite for borrowing that we are undertaking a number of development projects that warranty us to continuously borrow. So I think it's important to also discuss in context of how has Tanzania been able to do all that using local resources without necessarily relying so much on borrowing, as opposed to Uganda that seems to be uh, borrowing so much money to undertake all these resources, including financing shortfalls of the budget. 
So that said, let's dig deep into the conversations and get it started. I've lost Patrick briefly, but I'm going to start with Christine because Christine is still on uh, uh, is still online. So Christine, let's start with the subject and the topic on on uh, issues concerning our debt. I, as I recall clearly, in uh, 2000, there was that Jubilee 2000 Global Advocacy, I think which UDN championed. You are familiar with those uh, developments. At that point, we were among the highly indebted countries. And then, uh, so we had a debt relief under the highly indebted poor countries, under uh, one and under uh, the cohort two. But looks like we are almost back to where we were when that global advocacy took place. That said, why is Uganda, break it down for me and another ordinary person, why is Uganda finding itself in a situation that you addressed 20 years ago? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, yes, we are finding ourselves in this uh, same situation, if not worse, because of uh, some of the reasons which I'm going to elaborate here. And uh, one is because of the borrowing trends that we have taken over time. Just like you've mentioned, under HIPIC, that was the Highly Indebted Poor Countries Initiative, uh, and uh, later the MDRI, the Multilateral Debt Relief Initiative, Uganda actually achieved 100% debt forgiveness. Yeah, And uh, one of the reasons is because most of our, the biggest part, actually, our, our borrowers, our lenders, sorry, were, multi were, were concessional. Yeah? The multilaterals, the World Bank, the IMF, and so that is why we were able to lobby and uh, the debt was forgiven. But moving forward, we shall see later that because we have uh, taken on more commercial loans from private banks and you know individuals, uh, it's going to be increasingly harder to convince them to forgive our debt. And what does this increasing debt mean to the ordinary man, to you and me? If we look at the ordinary man, maybe in Kubo down there, uh, this means that you will have to be taxed more to pay this debt that we are accumulating at a high rate. Uh, this means you, the, the tax will, of course, be on the, the services and the goods that you procure. It could be on the sugar, on the salt. If you're going to board a taxi, the fare will have increased because of the fuel that has gone up. That is one. But secondly, how will it affect the common man, if this common man is a businessman, you have a small business uh, enterprise, whether medium uh, business enterprise, that means your chances of accessing credit uh, to grow your business will go down. Yeah, because uh, as government uh, borrows, we shall see later that uh, there's going to be an effect uh, on, on our ability to borrow externally, which will push us, which will push government to borrow domestically, and which we are seeing. And uh, of course, this crowds out the private sector because uh, the banks and, and, and the lenders within are comfortable lending to government and they're usually at high interest rates because government is desperate for the money. And uh, of course, it is better to lend to government than to you felix or to me who will most likely default so that is how it is going to affect uh, the common man and of course this ultimately affects the development because if i cannot access capital and grow my business i can you cannot generate enough taxes from me to be able to pay back yes well, well thank you and this is why i bring in patrick uh christine is trying to explain how I'm going to be affected by this relentless task of government borrowing. First of all, they have argued when they borrow that uh, one, they are trying to finance shortfalls in, 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 in shortfalls in uh, financing the budget. I think for about three or four years running straight, 
revenue tax collection, URIs fail to hit the target. So their challenge is there. But they're also arguing that uh, they need this money to mainly fund these major infrastructure projects like Karuma, Isimba, Indeb Express Highway, name it. Uh, but we've seen Tanzania address these challenges differently. Uh, the Auditor General, John Mwanga, in his report, he has actually been very, very disturbed by the way our borrowing is starting to become unsustainable, like those figures, because now it's standing at 63.35 trillion Uganda shillings. I want to understand who are those that, who are the leading lenders to Uganda that we owe this amount of money? Um, that we should be v, we should be be very scared of, and among the leading uh, lenders, are there those that probably whose terms are more stringent? That if me as Felix, I should be very very concerned about the future of this country, because I know also for a fact that when you look at the loan agreements that have been signed by the government of Uganda, you realize that there have been a lot of waiver on the immunity Uganda has in accessing these credits. So, what does that mean? I think, Katabazi, are you there? I seem to be losing Katabazi, okay. but I would have, but, uh, but, but let me bring you in here. Yeah, so... Okay, um, Katabazi, oh. Katabazi is back online. Yes, just hold it there. Katabazi, my, 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 my question still stands. Um, because I was trying to ask the pertinent question, who are these leading lenders to the country called Uganda that we should be scared of? Are there among those ones who we should really be concerned about? For example, I know in Zambia, China is a problem now. Is Uganda in the same basket? Yes, uh, most of uh, our loans uh, are with Marit Marit, what international organization, some called multilateral organizations. But lately, we have uh, started seeing other countries, such as China, lead, uh, lending uh, to Uganda. Then we have, like Christina had already elaborated, companies, private companies, lending to Uganda. Examples of these are commercial banks that are lending Uganda through syndicated loans. I know some people who may not have heard of this <clears throat> might think it is far-fetched, but every time we have had a budget shortfall, government of Uganda has entered into arrangements with various banks in Uganda, for example, Standard Bank, Standard Chartered, Standard Chartered Bank, who have worked in syndicate with other banks outside Uganda for the purposes of raising money uh, for onward lending to government of Uganda. So we can categorize uh, the loans that we have in my view in three categories. The category of married national organizations. These include World Bank, International Development Agency, uh, uh, African Development Bank, East African Development Bank. Then the other category uh, is of companies or nations, companies targeted on nations or nations themselves, such as China, who are lending to Uganda. And then, of course, the other ones being private entities, uh, including commercial banks. So for me, the the issue is that borrowing is not bad per se. What is bad in borrowing, number one, is the terms under which you are borrowing. The terms. This is very critical. And also for what? Now, our debt sustainability strategy emphasizes that we ought to consider borrowing for concessional loans. These are low interest loans, but also loans whose 
maturity period is for a, such a, a long time. Those are low risk. As opposed to getting money from countries or multinational organiz organizations, uh, whom interest is high, but uh, they take so long, I mean, the, 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 the period, the employment period is so short. So borrowing from whoever is not a problem. The problem is the terms. Some of the loans that we are getting have terms that are a little bit oppressive. You give an example of Zambia, where some of the terms include confiscating or attaching the property for which the loan was secured. So, so that was one element. The second element is for what? We have had a problem as Uganda in respect to defining clearly what we are borrowing for. And that has been occasioned by lack, by lack of a particular department of government until recently. That would be charged with a responsibility of project analysis, project approval, for the purposes of ensuring that the loan that you want secure is relevant, the amount is appropriate, and also the projections that are attached to that loan are reasonable. And, and in my view, that is where we have had a scenario where the auditor, auditor general indicates in his report time and again that so much of the loans have been secured, but for a period of two years to three years, some of the loans have even expired before they are utilized. Yet we have paid commitment fees, we have paid a lot of interest on them. So Ugandans should be wary of strict terms or harsh terms in the loan agreements but also in the viability of the projects that we are borrowing for this money. Wow. Uh, Patrick, thank you. The, but there's something here that, uh, to pick it up from there, and I think I'm going to first stay with you on this one. When you look at the, our date, our external date, which is about 67% of the total date, you realize that the amount of money we're supposed to pay back and our budget projections, um, if we may, if we had finance or to service these debts, we will not have any money left to finance the budget. When you look at the, 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 the debt ratio and the budget allocations and, and, and the budget projections, we don't have so much left to finance our budget. So what does this mean? If, Ugandan, what does this mean if you have a but if you have a date to pay and the amount you have is not even enough to run the country yes uh what it means that we are entering into sooner than later we are entering into a debt trap in fact it is not necessarily true that the money that we mobilize for resources uh, is not enough to pay the debt. In fact, what we are doing is that we are entering into a phase where we are even going to pay the debt. I'll give you an example. In the next financial accounting, the budget is projected at 45 trillion. Mm. The amount spent under various programs of government amounts to 29 trillion. Right? Meaning that we shall borrow finance the budget by over 8 trillion because our revenue projections are at 21 trillion so we need to get the deficit of that being about 7 or 8 trillion to finance the budget alone then ultimately you need again to borrow the rest of other monies for the purposes of not only financing the budget but also for financing debt repayment interest payment uh, as a matter of fact so, to move to our and see who the owner of the This means that, number one, government does not have adequate resources to invest in the people. What do I mean? When well, ordinary government has programs, for example, that deliver basic services such as health and education, if we continue in this trend, it will become extremely difficult for government to invest very efficiently in health, 
and in education and that will negatively affect this other person who is expecting quality health services uh, from a health center or education, better education services from a primary school and secondary school. The other element is that if government cannot generate enough resources for running its operations and is relying heavily on debt, it, it means that, like Christine had said, when the options of borrowing money from abroad are exhausted or have become less of coming, the focus is going to, to be in borrowing internally. And when the government borrows internally, it means that private individuals known to RNC will start competing with commercial banks. Now, how will that happen? Under normal circumstances, government borrows money from the private sector through commercial banks. And the commercial banks are happy to trade with government on that basis because government is not a risky borrower. But then that therefore means that it reduces the amount of money that is available for commercial banks to onward lend to private sector. Or if they do then, the interest rate shall only rise, rise, and rise. So move to our and see again. If we continue borrowing at this rate, we'll find it extremely difficult as we go along to borrow money from the, the commercial bank because the interest rate will be going up, going up because of the competition that will be, have been created by government. But also secondly, if government does not have adequate resources to invest in productive sectors such as social services, agriculture, it would therefore mean that the jobs that would have been needed to be created will not be there. And because that will not be there, it means that unemployment shall only continue to rise. And of course, we need to see where the economy is not performing, businesses are not starting, all businesses are collapsing, it means people cannot get jobs, because they cannot get jobs, they cannot get employment, whether, whether they cannot get income, and they cannot be able to meaningfully participate in the market, simply to purchase a few goods and services to run their life. So it also therefore means that the more the country gets indebted, the more it becomes constrained to look after its population, and the more its population ends up into abject poverty. Like Christine had said, or we, took, we, we said at the beginning of the show, that the reason as to why we had debt relief, total debt relief, mm. was because the world had come to the realization that if these obligations persisted, it would be extremely difficult for governments to implement programs that would get people out of poverty. So the rise in poverty was the number one consideration for debt relief. So now if we are sliding back, it means that the gain that we have so far registered in addressing poverty will be undermined and the mean RNC would expect them for the situation not to improve but actually to decline if we do not turn our debt appetite. Okay, okay. Um, still carrying the conversation from that direction. Uh, and uh, in about three minutes, we'll be going in a short break. But before we go for a short break, I'm coming to you, Christine, on this one. Um, because for me, I'm still disturbed. First of all, in the Otter General's report, again, I'll quote it. He talks about unspent, or oh, there's underabsorption of funds. So at one point, you are borrowing to finance a budget deficit. But in your... In, in, when you look at the Auditor General's findings, you find that uh, there are some money that are underspent. Okay, in actual sense, it's not even spent. But you're borrowing, arguing that the money you have is not enough. And then when we come to also the, the same report, it just, again talks about the underabsorption of loans. There are those loans whereby we've not necessarily even, we've borrowed, but we've not properly absorbed the money we've borrowed. So I'm trying to understand. I'm marrying the two. On one hand, you add you don't have enough resources. On the other hand, 
the report is is faulting you for one underabsorbing loans and also underabsorbing underabsorbing the budget allocations that have been provided for so is this does this speak to incompetence does this speak to theft and when you answer that put it in context of tanzania again I, i'm sorry i'm going to point to magufuli over and over because for me i think he proved something that many people uh the naysayers who believed in the foreign support i think are now rethinking the ideology because when you look at magufuli all that he did the majority of it came from how he was struggling in managing the resources that they had so what does this mean to yes, an ordinary person like me mm. thank you felix and uh, one i have not been part of the people or i do not uh, agree with uh, most of the people that say we do not have enough resources as a country to address our development needs or aspirations because like you clearly noted uh, you have under absorption you have wastage in other words the corruption huh? you have uh, for this uh, coming budget the 20, 21 22 we also the 481 billion for recapitalizing the bank of uganda that had bounced back and yet the bank of uganda was not aware because they received the money last year and now it comes back and apparently the ministry of finance is saying yeah it's not yet approved anyway so all this is about the management of the resources that we have and uh, the, the the solution really is not in borrowing because for as long as you keep borrowing and uh, putting in a pot maybe if you borrow and put in a pot that has a leakage you will never be able to fill that pot and i think that is where tanzania uh, to be more specific that's where magufuli uh, may his soul rest in peace uh, got it right you have to first address the corruption the mismanagement or the poor management the lack of planning the lack of absorption of the resources before you even uh, say that you do not have enough resources because we have money the loans that are there sleeping and sometimes the project uh, time comes to an end and yet the money is still there it is not yet spent one because maybe the project affected persons have not been compensated yet or many other anomalies in the planning we do not plan uh, before we get the resources we just borrow and then we begin planning backwards and that has taken us far but um also maybe to add uh, that uh, why we, why have we come to this uh, that is because uh, one like i said we have moved more towards the non concessional borrowing and which wouldn't be bad which wouldn't be bad but it is a trap because one it allows you to fund your development aspiration uh, to fund the big infrastructure projects because the funds are usually big they are usually large uh, sums of money compared to the concessional uh, but the danger is again that the interest like patrick had mentioned is higher uh, the, the the grant element is very minimal and uh, that the, 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 they expire in a short time they, they are, their their time frames are really usually short among other things so if you borrow such monies and usually these are commercial lenders like uh, you had said china and the private banks so they are not willing to make any losses right you will not expect to now have another hipic or mdri because these are after money they are making money so they will not forgive you unfortunately so if you go this uh, this line of borrowing that means you have to be frugal you have to make sure you invest and reap what you're going to do at to pay back but also you know fund your your, your development so that is where we have found ourselves in a trap because we keep borrowing and uh, we are not strict on the misuse of these funds when we borrow them and uh, that is one of the reasons why we have reached where we are and uh, just to confirm that uh, even the ministry of finance now acknowledges that we have moved from low debt distress to moderate that means we are moving towards failing to 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 pay back our debt or you know 
getting into a debt trap. But also at the, at the international level, we see some of these uh, credit rating agencies giving us a bad credit rating, uh, like you quoted the Auditor General's report. Uh, Fitch, which is one of the credit rating agencies, now gave us negative from uh, from uh, mod from uh, from from positive in June 2020. Our our rate our credit rating was revised from stable to negative, and all this means that it is getting more and more risky for these lenders, the external lenders, to lend to Uganda. So that has really brought us uh, to where we are. The increasing Debt, and that is why we have to run to the domestic market. And um, yeah, we are really caught up in a trap because even our economy seems to be growing downwards. We see it is from 6% in 2019 to 3%. And now as at December, we saw it was 2.9%. So all this, these uh, external lenders are watching. And so just like we said, um, uh, is government mortgaging our properties? Definitely, that will have to be because if if I'm an external lender and government comes to me with this level of risk, one, I will make my interest expensive. I will have to move the, the, the insurance costs on this loan higher, yes, to discourage one, this person from borrowing. But if they are able to borrow, then it will be very, very expensive. And that is what is happening with us. Wow, so if wow. we go to borrow externally, which is most likely because we don't have resources to fund the budget, uh, it's going to be very expensive. So we expect to see the debt rise even higher, and yet the economy is not growing uh, commensurate. Okay, thank, thank you, Christine. We are going for a short break, but when we come back, we are going to discuss this whole thing about supplementary funding. What is why? because there are also issues around there. And I think we shall marry this with the timing of supplementary funding in line with when we were heading towards um, the 2021 elections, whether it had any indication on how our elections were financed in that matter. We shall also discuss issues concerning how we negotiate our loans. Um, because um, again, the report points to how we, we seem to be giving away um, our immunity. The waiver we have for our immunity as a country, the way we negotiate, and I think again, I must be very interested to know what does this mean when you have a poorly negotiated loan. We will also uh, um, uh, discuss the old issues of uh, there's what we call what this what usually uh, Parliament approves a certain threshold of what we can borrow, but it's very clear when you look at the report that um, we we what was approved and what was actually borrowed is way above. Was this coincidental? We are going to have a discussion in that direction. So let's take a short break, then we'll be back in about an hour, a minute. 